You are back on the legal line with Dennis Kennelly. Uh, remind you again, our phone number six six one two nine eight five four eight seven. I neglected to tell you who our team is today. Our producer is Nikki London. How you doing, everybody? And our engineer, Hi. par excellence, is Aaron Delatore. And with me is uh, my good friend and our guest, uh, one of my favorite guests, Mark Sullivan. And we just talked about the significance of the Lyft Uber case up in San Francisco. But we're going to switch gears slightly here and get to something that I think most people really don't understand. Combination of both employers and employees. As you know, in California, uh, you're supposed to get a meal period. Uh, and you're also supposed to get two rest periods based on a number of hours that you work. And question I often get coming into my office is what if the employer places some restrictions on me what I'm for example I'm supposed to eat lunch at my desk and answer the phone if it comes in and uh, mark your thoughts on that well uh, the uh, <clears throat> big thing is in January 2015 the California Supreme Court issued an opinion that uh, Chain, that overruled uh, lower court opinions uh, involving security guards. It was basically security guards that uh, um, would be on a, at a work site, you know, basically something under construction, and at night there's not much happening, um, and they could essentially take a nap or whatever, but they were on call and uh, relying on, you know, rules, precedent, tradition, etc. Under a federal wage and hour law, the uh, I'd say probably the general opinion was that just being on call did not make you quote on duty, uh, and therefore you didn't have to be paid. California Supreme Court said that under California's more employer friend employee friendly uh, wage orders, that that did uh, consist of on duty time. Um, that meant, for example, that uh, uh, construction sites that would have one security guard on duty either had to have another security guard or would have to pay the one-hour additional pay for you know, having the employee have an on-duty you know, uh, rest period or an on-duty meal period. Uh, and by the way, those, those can be pyramided, so they can have multiple ones. It's a, it would be a huge increase uh, in expense. That has not as yet sorted out, but it's my understanding from, uh, um, and this is, you know, I'm basing this on, uh, you know, cases that I've seen, you know, positions taken, I should say, by the, the uh, Division of Labor Standards Enforcement, which is the California agency that enforces California wage and hour law, so-called DLSC, or most people refer to them as the, as the, quote, labor commissioner, that the labor commissioner is taking a very, you know, literal rigid position on that um it's a uh, and i and i very commonly in businesses uh especially small businesses the assumption is yeah you've got your break but it's you know if there's a call that comes in you've got to take the you've got to take the call um it's kind of the way people have always done business but there's a very significant exposure for an employer that uh, um you know, sort of loosely goes along with that. Um, what's the answer to it? Well, everybody that's looked at this that, you know, was on the employer side is saying, you know, it's a nice legalistic opinion, but it's it, not the real world. It's not practical. It's case, but it's the law. Yeah, but it's the law. It is now the law in California, unless and until the legislature does something to modify it, and uh, the California legislature, as currently constituted, there's not a, no way are they going to uh, uh, enact an employer-friendly version of uh, the way, you know, change to the wage and hour law. In any event, it's, it is a really uh, dangerous area for employers if they have people that are taking, uh, you know, that because they're, they're a small employer, that the individuals can't take a, a true, you know, off-duty leave period. There's a big wage and hour exposure. Exactly. I mean, I go, I go back to a story when I was uh, an in-house counsel for a major newspaper here in California. 
And I remember yelling at an employee who was, quote, on her break while a customer was waiting. And I, you know, I said, please handle the customer. And then I took her aside and said, customer comes first. And in those days, that was okay to do. Right now, I would be committing a violation of the law. No, you just have to pay her. I mean, let's say you, you have her work for one minute, you have to pay her an hour's worth of pay. Exactly. It's, yeah, we used to call it buying lunch or buying a break time. Right, but it's pretty expensive. By the way, for people that are interested, the name of the case, if you, can, you can Google it. It's Mendiola, M-E-N-D-I-O-L-A, versus CPS Security Solutions. That's the California Supreme Court opinion. Um, it's very significant opinion from the, in the labor area, the wage and hour area. Now, well, I have a question. We, uh, this is Nikki London chiming in, who's actually been a supervisor uh, in a phone room operation. Uh, yeah, so what if uh, in a scenario, say, um, say that uh, you're required to take your, your 45 minute lunch, uh, in, in my particular case it was 45 minutes, um, but hey, look, I've got a lot of work to do, I really don't have 45 minutes to go, you know, to not be working. Um, so generally what I would do, I would get up, I would swipe my time clock, go back to my desk, eat some chips while I continue to work, watch the clock, 45 minutes later, go swipe back in, never technically took a lunch, but, I mean, physically didn't really take a lunch, but technically on the time card, uh, you know, I was always able to get away with that. Nobody ever really stopped me from doing that. That's, what that is, I, I refer to my clients, as you talk about employer purgatory, because the law says that the employer is liable, um, the employer that suffers or permits somebody to work is that is your employer that you know that lets you do that that uh, didn't police it is just as liable for a violation of the law as the guy sitting there with a black hat and a whip saying you had to work during lunch. It's all treated the same. Huh? Interesting. Uh, well, it's that, yeah, yeah, but it really puts a, it makes it very difficult for an employer um, because there are employees that you know conscientiously want to you know get the job done. Right. The presumption that's made, the presumption that underlies these wage and hour laws, they were all they were all written. People don't know the history of them. The history of them is very important. They were written during the Depression, and the concept was that if you limited work to, in those days, I think the original was 45-hour a week, if you limited the hours of work that someone could work, then the employers would have to hire more people, reducing unemployment. That, that was the original driver for the law, and that has kind of been forgotten, in fact, it has been forgotten, but in practical reality, what it amounts to, it's uh, in the railroads, they used to refer to it as feather bedding, it means that employers have to have more employees than they might otherwise have uh, to be efficient. Um, now, query in a world economy where uh, some would say in some businesses we're having our lunch eaten by the Chinese, whether we can afford to do it, uh, that's nonetheless the law in the United States. And it's the law on steroids in California. Well, and another interesting uh, aspect is how does this impact, uh, let's say, a home health care a facility where you've got maybe 15 or 16, let's call them live-in patients, and what do you do with somebody? They obviously, for insurance purposes, have to have somebody on duty 24-7. So the person oh. that's working like 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., uh, what do you do? You, you get the same security guard problem. I mean, oh, that person has to be, you know, because... Your lunch, you have to be free to leave the premises. You have the security guard problem on steroids. Um, and I would urge anybody, if uh, anybody that uh, uh, you know, runs a, what's called a residential care facility for the elderly at RCFE, um, they're heavily, you know, heavily regulated by the state. And you're right, there, there, are, there are regulatory requirements on... You know, what the staffing is, and they have to submit staffing levels, that who's on hand, etc. cetera. Um, it's a really tricky area of the law because there are 
there are several federal exemptions under the federal wage and hour law um, that you are know, that are really followed as if they you know, I'll say as if they were the law. They're letters from the Department of Labor that uh, routinely and regularly operators have followed as being the law. There's a question in California whether or not you can uh, abide by those federal letters under this Mendiola case. Probably not. I would agree Therefore, with you. Yeah. So probably you can't rely on the guidance from the, the federal labor law. Um, and the end result is that uh, um, there's special exemptions, for example, for ambulance drivers for their sleeping time. There's no special exemption for uh, persons who work in a residential care facility for the elderly. You then have to go into, there's a, uh, a wage hour that deals with them. Um, it's too, uh, too broad a topic to cover, you know, in a, a call-in show like this, but uh, uh, in that context, uh, that is, you know, the, the care facilities, um, the issues and problems are many, and uh, uh, I, my experience is I think a lot of people just, they throw up the and just kind of use common sense, and in wage and hour law, you can't use common sense. <laughs> No, especially not in California, no. I mean, and, and one of the more typical problems with, uh, with meal periods and rest periods is you've got somebody that says, the heck with it. I, I don't need to take a half hour or 45 minutes for lunch. I don't need my two breaks. In order to beat traffic, uh, what I want to do is no lunch, no breaks. So... That means I only work a seven-hour day instead of an eight-hour day. You can't do that without paying the penalties. Yeah, that's, that's the problem that employers complain about is that essentially, um, and it's employees as well, is that the state has uh, taken away, um, you know, the ability for, you know, the ability for persons to make a, you know, private decision. But on the other hand, I mean, there were obviously there were many abuses. That's, uh, you know, it's, it's not... It's not clear cut either way. You know, there are employers that take huge advantage. Uh, I think there's employees that take huge advantage of something like that, especially in a smaller workplace. Um, I mean, that that example exactly right there. Um, you know, for me, uh, if I wanted to leave an hour early, I could, you know, just eat my lunch at my desk and, and maybe not clock out. Nobody would even pay attention to that. If I didn't clock out, nobody really cared. It'd be a week later before somebody said anything. By then, it didn't matter. So, well, actually, actually, what what you're talking about is back in the late 1990s. There was I always thought I think it was really kind of ironic. Um, the wage and hour law was changed in the mid 90s to allow you know significant flexibility in several areas, not specifically the area we're talking about. Several areas on the, you know daily overtime. And then in the year 2000, um, a former state senator introduced a low, uh, a bill. I, I always laughed at the title. It was called the, the Workplace Flexibility Act. And, of course, what the for Workplace Flexibility Act did was introduced absolutely rock-solid, rigid parameters, eliminating any flexibility. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Only in California, Mark. Only yeah, in California. Maybe, AB sixty in nineteen ninety nine. I mean, it was just it was kind of laughable the title, but uh, um, you know the, the we did have a period in the late nineties where there was much more flexibility. Now, I mean, under the, the laws that exist now, if employers and employees want to have a flexible work week, for example, you can do it, but it requires formal elections. I mean, it's very formalistic. You don't just sit down over coffee and say, okay, I'm going to work 10 hours Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. You have to have actual documentation that has to be submitted right. to the labor board. It's a, uh, uh, it can be done, but um, you know, don't just do it, through it. If you want to do an alternate work week, you definitely need to see, talk to counsel or somebody who is a you know, knowledgeable uh, HR person and you know, submit the, uh, this necessary paperwork. Yeah, what it, what it comes down to is that the state takes the position that they're going to be the guardian of the workers' rights and that the worker and the employer can't contract around what the law is. 
It's that simple. Well, as I always tell all my employer clients, um, everybody in California has a union. It's called the state of California. <laughs> I mean, the, the work rules imposed by the state of California uh, are, you know, compared to maybe 35 states in the country, uh, look much more like a, a uh, you know, union work rules uh, than state law. Yeah, they're you tougher know. than most union contracts elsewhere. Exactly, well, exactly. To the point, to the point that you got the uh, in California, strangely, that there's an exemption from all the work rules, usually for contrary work rules in a collectively bargained agreement. And nine times out of ten, the union member has you know, less lunch and work and uh, break rules than the non-union member because the collective bargaining agreement is written. You know, to be a uniform rule that applies in California or in Tennessee, and it's less generous than the rule that the state of California applies to everybody. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Uh, we have got uh, one more break before we leave, so let's take it now. You're on the legal line with Dennis Kennelly, and we'll be right back. So the strains of Hush and Whispers by London Rain, and Nikki London is the lead singer on, of that particular musical organization, and she has a very interesting issue she'd like to raise. Uh, yeah, this was brought to my attention yesterday. Um, this is frustrating. Um, Trump signed an order on Monday revoking protections signed into law by President Obama in 2014. Uh, Obama had signed an executive order banning LGBT discrimination among federal contractors. He concurrently signed an order requiring contract to businesses uh, prove that they're complying with federal laws and executive orders. President Trump has rescinded the latter order, making it much more difficult to know whether a business has committed to ending LGBT bias in hiring, firing, and promotions. Okay, guys, what does that mean? Okay, first of all, we want to remind everybody that in California, there is a stringent anti-discrimination uh, law on LGBT discrimination. The California state law is far more far more liberal than the federal law. And what this does in my view, and Mark feel free to chime in, is it's just I think unfortunately for Mr. Trump it was a it was a bow to his conservative what he views as his conservative base. Uh, that I think in California will have little effect, but nationally, like for example in Mississippi, could mean a heck of a lot. Right. I actually, I actually think it is much more. Uh, it's much narrower than that, and I'll tell you why. Is there were yeah there were two there's there were two levels of criticism about that order. One level, you know, the the biggest level of criticism was that. Um, by executive order, you know, now, Gray, remember, under Title VII, or under federal law, um, being labeled a discriminator, it's almost like it's quasi-criminal. I mean, you get punitive damages. It's a pretty serious thing to be, to be labeled as. Uh, same under state law, even more so under state law. But it's, it's not like you were negligent. It's a, it's a pretty ugly thing if you're labeled as a discriminator. Um, the problem with Obama's uh, executive order is that the law, the, the federal law, only says it's illegal to discriminate on the basis of sex. And many, many, many federal courts have looked at that and have construed that relatively narrowly. Ergo, does that mean it's a good policy or a bad policy, uh, you know, not to have Title VII extend? The argument that's made, and I think it's a valid argument, is that that's a political question that Congress should address. That should be in the law that the president doesn't have authority to do it, to make somebody liable uh, in the extreme way you're liable under Title VII. So at one level... Um, he was rescinding an order that many people feel was unconstitutional. Now, the public policy aspect of it, that's a completely separate issue. That's a political issue. Exactly, and that's uh, something that... It's, acad it's academic in California, because uh, California, the uh, Fair Employment Housing Act is, is, you know, 
is beyond, way beyond, uh, you know, just uh, you know, generic LGBT discrimination. You, you've got protections against uh, uh, you know, rules requiring people to wear pants. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's oh yeah, they kind of have to have that here. That 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 yeah. was a big one. Yeah, hey, back in the day, that was a big one. It's it's actually in the law that uh, it's illegal to have rules requiring uh, requiring people employees to wear pants. I guess people were offended; they were being required to wear dresses or something. Yeah, the California law is so liberal; it's a kind of a non-issue. On the national level, frankly, I you know uh, I wasn't paying much attention to that. I knew that there was a whole group of executive orders that that President Obama signed that uh, um, a lot of legal purists were saying exceeded his authority as president, and I think that was one of them. Okay, well, uh, we're, uh, we are coming up uh, on the end of the show. As usual, uh, Mark, we still have so much to talk about and only an hour to do it, or less. So I really want to thank Mark Sullivan, our guest. Mark, tell people how to get in touch with you. Oh, yeah, I'm a private practitioner, again, in labor law and uh, labor and employment law and aviation law, if you happen to be a pilot needing a lawyer. And I'm in Westlake Village, and I'm readily found on the Internet. Well, that is outstanding. I want to thank our, our, our usual crack group of people working with us. We have Nikki London, my uh, producer today, and our engineer, Aaron Delatore. And I want to thank everybody for calling in, listening, and we look forward to talking with you next week on The Legal Line. I'm Dennis Kennelly. Have a good day.